All right, good morning everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Shane and with me I have David Budge, the Managing Director of Aurora Labs. David will give us a brief company presentation which will be followed by a question and answer session. Our webinar format allows for questions to be submitted at any time through the online webinar platform and we've also received some questions via email before the uh, webinar that David will go through. The presentation slides which you see on your screen have come from the full presentation lodge with the ASX this morning which is also available from the Aurora website. Thanks for joining us and I'll now hand over to David. Well good morning everybody and um, thanks for joining us. Uh, this initial presentation will only be about 15 minutes, so it's relatively brief uh, compared to the full presentation. But the um, full document is available on our website and you can review it at your own leisure. <clears throat> okay, first off, we just have a standard corporate snapshot. And then there's a slide on our key personnel. So recently we've added a couple of new <clears throat> directors, a chairman and an NED to the board. That's Paul Christensen and Mel Ashton. <clears throat> I'd like to focus at this stage specifically on the investment highlights and just to um, clarify a few things. Firstly, I think this is worth, <clears throat> excuse me, taking a moment to pause and, and reflect on this. And that's that the market we're going after is actually a uh, multi-trillion dollar market. It's, it's not a small market at all, it's an enormous pie. So the analogy I'd use in this is, I think, and the reason I give you this analogy is I think that often we're um, confused with us competing against existing um, 3D printing companies. And the reality is, sure, they are competitors. But the primary market uh, that we're actually going after is a completely different market from the one that they're addressing. And I think that's worth noting. So if you, you look at an example that I thought of earlier on today was just, if you look at the early days of Apple, um, they were compared quite uh, early on to IBM. Um, <clears throat> and the analogy is um, apt from my point of view, because while Apple and IBM both produce computers, they were in completely different market segments at that point in time. So <clears throat> comparing at that point in time and saying Apple was competing against IBM wasn't exactly appropriate. And the same with us, if you compare us to some of the existing 3D printing companies in the market, we're not going after the same markets. So it's a completely different segment. <clears throat> In the second section of investment highlights really looks at our clear commercialization strategy. So we're moving fast, you know, full steam ahead with the medium and large format printers and we're ticking off milestones. We're advancing cooperation with industry partners and the powder production unit has been set up and tested and we're ticking off milestones there. At the same time, we've got the distributors in place and we're commercializing the S-Titanium Pro. At the back of that, we've got a strong cash position to support the growth and future development with our latest achievements, we've had the new board appointments, which I just mentioned. The large format technology prototype has been able to print simple parts at market speed. And I'll go into some detail about how important that is later. We just recently can, completed a successful 5 million capital raising, and that's to accelerate the development of the large format technology. And the powder production unit has been completed and tested. And finally, we've just recently appointed another distributor. Uh, for Russia, for the small format printers. <clears throat> Next slide is probably going to be of interest to some people. <clears throat> On the right hand side, you can see a, I guess, a partial screenshot of uh, alpha version of the medium format printer, which we're taking to the Rapid TCT show at Fort Worth in Texas. Now, the Rapid show is one of the largest, um, I believe it is the largest actually, 3D printing show in the world and we'll be showcasing the machine at that point then. Um, I'll also be meeting with a number of industry partners and other groups while I'm in the US. This slide gives the relative position of the large format technology compared to existing machines and processes. On one side, you have uh, the estimated price of the machines um, derived from market data. On the other side, you have the print speed. As you can see, and the ball size indicates the, or the dot size indicates the size of the print bed. As you can see, the, the large format technology has an enormous print bed, and it's um, 
considerably faster than anything else in the marketplace, with the exception possibly of desktop metal. Um, however, desktop metal has a technology which is predominantly suited for small parts that weigh less than five kilos and generally have a thickness of less than five millimetres, whereas we're looking at being able to produce large parts very, very rapidly. Now, the key differentiator with a large format technology is we're looking to be able to print large parts, or even small parts if we want to, but large parts um, at a very high speed and a very high resolution that are what we call complex parts. So something like a cylinder would be a, not a particularly complex part, but something like one of the rooks you see on our website would be a complex part. So the ability to prove complex parts rapidly is critical uh, to the advancement of this technology. You see the timeline which we've got in front of us now, and we've ticked off a number of the key points there. Now, people often ask me how we um, understand the technology and how do we know that it works. Uh, the analogy I often use with people is, <clears throat> is simply this. If I handed you a candle and a box of matches, you would uh, understand very easily on how to light the candle because you understand both what a candle is and how a box of matches works. So it's pretty straightforward for you to do that. Uh, for myself and the engineers who work with me at Aurora, it's also very straightforward to us that the technology will work for that very same reason, is that we understand the fundamentals behind it. And so from our point of view, it's obvious that the technology will work. Um, if we go through the various steps in this process, um, the latest one we've ticked off is printing simple parts at market speed. Now, the reason that's an important step, it basically looks at um, the all of the individual components in the actual process and essentially the printing parts at simple parts at market speed indicates that we've all of those parts of individual parts in this case the matches and the candle have all been tested and it demonstrates that they work effectively the next part which is printing complex parts at market speed and i want to be clear we're differentiating market speed as basically being about as fast as everybody else in the market at this point in time um, <clears throat> not going at the very high speed we're looking to do with the when we've completed the large format technology. So when we print complex parts at market speed, it means we'll be in a similar position, if not better, but in a similar position to other players in the market. And if we did nothing else, we could potentially build great machines and sell them into the market and compete effectively. Now, if you look at our peers, and there's a slide at the end of this um, slideshow, if you look at our peers, most of those guys are in the, a significantly different value to where we're placed right now. Um, the next two steps are really the major turning points in terms of the development of the technology. The first one is printing simple parts rapidly. So again, that's something like a cube, but doing it with extremely high speed. And the third one, and the reason that is important, it basically ticks off for the first time to demonstrate that this technology is extremely viable, that the system has been able to demonstrate the high speeds which we've been talking about from day one. The third step is printing complex parts rapidly. So an example of a complex part is a valve or a turbine or a um, one of the rooks that we've printed and demonstrated and showed to a lot of people where you can see the staircase on the inside. There's a number of additive manufacturing techniques that are around, like welding, for instance, uh, that are very fast, but they're... Um, they can't produce complex parts, and that's a critical part of this process. If you want to be 3D printing a part, it needs to be able to produce complex parts. So printing a complex part at high speed will be, um, I guess, essentially proving out the technology. Um, and that's a very significant turning point. We'll think there'll be an, an enormous amount of interest generating the company at that point. The additional steps along the process in this timeline really look at producing pre-production models for industry partners, that's machines that we'll be making and selling to industry partners. Um, CE certification is critical because it's uh, important for getting us to the market. And then starting full commercial production towards the end of this year of the medium format printers and moving on with the development of the large format technology. Another key <clears throat> process we're going through at the moment is what we call our industry partner program that we started rolling out a little while ago. This is essentially um, sprung out of the fact that we realise that um, there's a number of industries that are going to be significantly affected by this technology as we move forward. 
And so we're looking to work with key partners from each of these industries to give them access to the technology in an early stage and also to work with them through the process of starting from essentially the beginning, with, which is where we're at now, all the way through to a point where they're able to produce parts for their own company um, <clears throat> and to implement them in service. So the sectors we're looking at, there's really half a dozen sectors and we're looking at getting somewhere between five and 10 industry partners on over the next little while. Um, the total, the main areas we're looking at are uh, marine, oil and gas, mining, automotive, aerospace, and potentially major projects as well. Um, this is where the next slide comes in appropriately is a binding term sheet with Whirly Parsons. So the deal with Whirly Parsons really, is, there's three major components to it. The first one is uh, a joint venture that we're setting up um, to create what we call a solution center called Additive Now. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a second. The second one is the licensing and distribution agreement for our printers. The reason that's important is essentially we're plugging into an enormous network of existing sales force that is already in place. And this company can make introductions at the highest level to um, virtually every major mining, oil and gas and major projects company in the world. So from our point of view, it's a significant step in terms of commercializing, commercializing our technology. The solution centre is another critical <clears throat> step in that process, and I'll explain why now by giving the example of two different groups we've been speaking to um, and what their interest is in around our technology. So on one example, we have a group which has basically said to us, look, and this is a, a mining uh, company in the southwest of Australia, they've said to us, look, we currently burn through about $700 million a year worth of parts and <clears throat> What we want to do is we want to do everything ourselves. It's quite a different proposition from what most people say to us, but this is what they want to do. They want to uh, design, redesign all of their own parts. They want to handle the certification of those parts and they want to re-engineer everything. And ultimately what they want to do is to print everything. So that's a whole as bolts approach um, where they want to do absolutely everything ourselves. And they'd like us, uh, in conjunction with the Solution Centre, essentially walk them through that process. On the other extreme, we have another group we're talking to, um, and they've said to us, look, we don't want to have to worry about any of that. What we would like to do is we would like to be able to press a part on a screen or click on a part on a screen and have it turn up in three days. So we want to completely eliminate our current inventory or as much as possible and to replace it with a digital inventory and we want you to handle all of that. So the conversations like this are going on uh, fairly extensively with our industry partners and Whirly Parsons is heavily involved or rather the, the solution centre, which is the joint venture we're building with them, is heavily involved with that. Um, where Whirly Parsons comes into it is they bring um, a lot of technical know-how and engineering muscle to the table, so to speak, and um, uh, they also have ongoing relationships with a lot of these organisations already. Uh, what we bring to the table is the technical know-how and the technology to make all of this possible. So between the two of us, we believe it's quite a unique and very effective um, joint venture that we're going to use moving forward. And what it does do is allow us as a small company to leverage off their enormous size and capability um, to basically handle every type of possible customer that can come through the door from a, a large company that wants to do everything themselves to a company that doesn't want to do anything and would like to just have a part turn up in three days, in which case we would set up a print bureau, we would sign an offtake agreement and handle the whole thing so that through the solution centre so that all the parts that that customer has would ultimately be certified and be able to be printed and delivered to them in a just-in-time process. So there's, I believe, enormous potential in that, um, that joint venture. It has been progressing extremely well. We've been basically had the contracts bouncing back and forth between our respective lawyers and we'll announce the market as soon as we've signed on the dotted line. Um, <clears throat> the small format printers are still uh, moving along. The sales pipeline has been increasing significantly with that. The um, <clears throat> Well, I think it asks the question, why have we not sold more of these printers? 
and it's a fair question. I think the reality is, is when we went out to the market with the small format printer initially, we um, we did not um, expect people to have the reaction they did. And the reality is, is the primary reaction we had initially was people looked at the printer and went, look, I don't believe you can make a printer that prints these parts for $50,000. So there's a certain amount of skepticism there. But the other thing we found, which was also something we weren't expecting, was that for the most part, because we're so far away and we're in Australia, um, the um, the part, the having customers in another country where you don't have somebody on the ground was problematic. So we needed to set up the network, which we've been doing, and you can see that in the next slide. And essentially, we needed to set up the distributor network. And that's been done. And as we're doing that, we're finding that <clears throat> sales are starting to come through a lot more steadily. Just clicking on to the powder production. Now, the powder production process <clears throat> is quite an important one for us for a number of reasons. In the medium to long term, it's important because we're looking to produce powders for the large format machines. To give you an example, a single large format machine, if it's printing a ton a day worth of parts, we'll be looking to use a ton a day worth of powder. So for a low cost powder, like something like stainless steel at $20 a kilo, the cost for the revenue from a single machine just for stainless steel would be around about $6 million a year. So it's a fairly significant ongoing revenue stream. The other thing which we've been looking at a lot more closely recently is with the capability with the powder production unit, we're looking to be able to produce much higher quality powders at a much lower cost than anybody else. And the driver here is that potentially we can start producing powders for markets like the metal injection molding market and similar ones when there's an enormous market there. They're sized in the billions. So that would be a great um, revenue stream for the company moving forward. <clears throat> this is a timeline on the powder production unit. Um, I think it outlines pretty clearly what we're looking to do over the next little while. But the goal is over the next 12 months to build a full-size powder production unit capable of producing up to five tons a day with the powder. <clears throat> so just to summarize in a nutshell what we're looking to do with the, um, the software side of it and tying it into the powders and the, um, the uh, digital rights management. So one of the things we're looking to set up is what we call a um, a digital store, something a bit similar to an iTunes type store, but uh, basically for housing digital parts. This would allow customers like the one I was speaking of earlier to be able to access, download their parts onto a printer and have it printed in real time and certified at the same time. So this would allow somebody on the south and in the northwest of WA or even on an oil and gas platform to print a part, have it certified in real time. And this is where our relationship with DMVGL comes in. They're one of the world's largest certification bodies. It would allow us to have the part printed in real time and certified in real time so that they can literally take the part out of the machine, have any final machining or any post-processing done on it that's necessary, and then have it ready for service. And that's ultimately where we're looking to go with that process. Here's a quick look at some relative market valuations. And <clears throat> as you can see, compared to other um, uh, contemporaries in the market, like SLM, Concept Laser, and RCAM, uh, we're relatively uh, undervalued. So <clears throat> why, why us? Why be involved with us? Why should you be a shareholder? And what's the potential going forward? I think the key thing here is I'm going to have to wrap it up relatively quickly because I'm already over time on this part of the discussion today, um, is <clears throat> the large format technology has the capability of potentially revolutionising manufacturing, and that's not a small thing. The market we are looking at is enormous, and it's not a market that other players are actually moving into at this point in time. Sure, there's a possibility that competitors might come along, and that's the case with any technology company. Um, so there's an enormous amount of interest that's being generated in the large format technology in major industries, and also in the powder production process as well. And this has um, been accelerated by a relationship with Worley Parsons. Um, with the printer and having um, <clears throat> the use of powders which will be exclusively produced or, or sold by us 
So that's one of the key things you're looking to lock into place is ultimately every large format or medium format printer that goes out in the market will be uh, linked to our printers so that they can certify a part. And ultimately it's important that the parts are certified because if you imagine this, <clears throat> if you're going to uh, print a part on a mine site, you want to make sure that that part is actually suitable for service. You can't have a part being installed and then blowing up. That's the last thing you want, which is why it's absolutely critical to have the parts certified. And then the person or the liability rests with the certification body, not with the actual company that's doing the printing. So the binding term sheet with Whirly Parsons and establishing additive now is another critical first step. And <clears throat> the um, as far as we're aware, we're the only 3D metal printing company in the world that has a universal part certification process and um, tied that in with a very large certification body like DMVGL. On top of that, we have taken out patents on all of our technology and multiple different levels. Um, I think our total suite of patents at the moment is running at around about 56, and that's increasing every day. Um, and as we move forward, that will expand significantly. So I think I'll leave it there. There's the latest ASX highlights, and then we'll move into the um, uh, question and answer part of the session. All right, excellent. Thanks very much, David. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, you can submit questions through the, uh, through the webinar software, um, and we'll see them here and be able to read them out. Um, before we get on to that, we'll start with some of the ones that we've received um, ahead of time. Uh, so I'll start with a question that we've received from Levin, uh, which is, uh, what is your competitive technology advantage compared to peers, and do you exclusively own your technology? So just, I'll talk about the ownership first. So yes, we do exclusively own our technology. We don't owe any licenses to anybody else or anything like that. Um, we've, as mentioned previously, we've taken out extensive patents on um, a number of different uh, aspects around the technology. Um, and from our understanding, it is uh, completely novel and unique, but we will, um, <clears throat> the other side of it there is, in terms of our competitive advantage and where are we placed to our peers, I think this ties in very much to what we we're talking about previously in that as far as we can see at this point in time, uh, we are the only company that is looking to be able to print at very, very high speeds, uh, complex parts um, <clears throat> and very large parts as well. So when you combine the high speed, complex and large parts, there's an enormous market there. And when we're talking about the metal manufacturing market, that's the market we're going after. It's not a small pie we're looking at. So um, how's our technology compared to peers? We believe it's um, you know, a fair step ahead of the rest of the market. Um, it's completely different from existing technology in the marketplace. And that's one of the things that makes it unique. And yes, we do own it exclusively. Yes. All right, David, I've got a, another question received from Carlo. Uh, why did you raise funds at the time uh, that you did? Look, we've um, <clears throat> the, the company at the moment has really got four primary goals it's focusing on. The first one is we're looking to get the large format technology to market as fast as possible. The second one is to bring the powder production process into production, start producing producing and selling powders. The third one is to speed up the rollout of our large form, no, sorry, of our industry partner program. And the industry partner program is important because it does provide market validation. It's one of the ways which investors can understand uh, the true benefits of the technology. And the third one is to, or fourth one is to get the, as many of the small format printers out the door as possible. Now, particularly with the large format technology and to a lesser extent with the powder production process, accelerating that and getting to market as fast as possible is absolutely critical. And uh, and that needs funding to speed that up. So that's why we raised money at that time. All right, thanks David. And a further question from Carlo, do you think that you'll require further capital for the uh, powder development? Well, at, that mo at the moment we're pretty comfortable with the capital we have. Um, <clears throat> one of the advantages with the um, powder production process is, or the unique one we've, we've patented, is that it's, it's relatively low capital intensive, which means that the cost for us, and to give you an example, 
the cost for a competitor to set up a powder production plant is around about $25 million, which is enormous. And so I can understand why people might be concerned about that. Um, the cost for us is significantly less than that. So, um, yeah, we've already built our first prototype. Um, we're not expecting the full size unit to eat into our cash reserves significantly. Okay, thanks, David. Um, I've got another question from Levin. Uh, how is the MFP LFP technology going to compare against Titomic's kinetic fusion machine? And what are your technology and commercial advantages, disadvantages, sorry, advantages or disadvantages? Not necessarily against Atomic, but just against the other printers in the market. Sure. So um, there's been a, a reasonable amount of comparison with us and Titomic, and to be perfectly blunt, I don't think that's a that's a reasonable comparison to make, um, simply because the, the technology is completely different. The other thing is what Titomic does isn't really 3D printing. It's a it's what you call an additive manufacturing process. So yes, it is, and it is a process that can actually manufacture parts by adding material to them. But um, as far as I'm aware, there's no physical way they could print something like one of our rooks. So the process of 3D printing is really about being able to print complex parts. What we're adding to the equation is to be able to print large complex parts rapidly. Um, and a complex part can have voids, it can have internal cavities, it could have stairs on the inside of a part. So um, the difference between the two technologies is ultimately, I think it's best represented by the markets we're going after is Titomic is really looking at the, as far as I'm aware anyway, is really the titanium parts market. And that's got a, a certain size. Um, however, it's only a um, comparatively small niche compared to the market which we're going after, which is ultimately the metal manufacturing market. But yes, technically, they could be considered a competitor, but only technically, because then from a practical point of view, um, the market they're heading into is completely different from the market we're heading into. So we don't really see them as a competitor, um, and we don't see their technology as competing directly with ours. All right, thanks, David. Um, I've now got a question from Paul. Um, and Paul has asked, uh, Aurora Labs is in an industry that historically has a very large capital commitment to research and development. How does Aurora Labs expect to deliver shareholder value for their current investment from this point in time? Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, we're an innovation-based company. So primarily we deliver value by innovating. But the other key thing is by kicking goals, essentially. Um, we've got our timelines which are out there pretty clearly and there's a number of key points to tick off on that timeline. Um, as we tick off particular points, um, the company's position is going to change and I believe change significantly over a period of time. So that's our two primary ways of delivering value at this stage. All right, thanks David. And a further question from Paul. Uh, how does Aurora Labs expect to position itself mm -hmm. amongst the current large players in the industry? who potentially have access to large R&D development budgets? You know, that's an interesting question. I actually got asked a very similar question by a group um, that were at the, there's a, a 3D printing company called Stratasys that um, um, they're basically, they predominantly manufacture 3D plastic printers. But um, the, conversation I had with them, and this was in the very early days of the company where we'd come out with our first product, um, was something along the lines of, how have you managed to do so much with so little? Because we have a relatively, and they, they admitted they're a large company, they've got a lot of people working for them, and they're, um, they've got some very, very smart, a lot of very smart people working for them, and they hadn't managed to do what we had in a comparatively short time frame. So, um, <clears throat> There's really the the primary one in terms of how we position ourselves uh, against the larger players at this point in time is through being innovative. But the second one, and this is important to note, is really what I was, I guess I was commenting on earlier, is that currently if you look at all the other major players in the market, most of them are still focused on the existing 3D printing market. And that's not our focus. Our focus is on the metal manufacturing market. So, that's where uh, we're going for, and we think that you know, we eventually have some competitors there, but we don't see any there at this point in time. All right, thanks, David. Um, and a further question from Paul. How consistent has the density been for the simple parts that have been printed at market speeds to date um, by the uh, the MFP prototype? Sure, that's, well, 
I would say the density has been exceptionally high um, and it's been very consistent. Um, yeah, that's probably about all I can say to that at this point. Yeah. Okay, thanks, David. Just a reminder, Trevon, if you'd like to submit a question online, you can do so through the webinar software. Um, I have a question from Levin. Um, and what is the company aiming to get out of the research agreement with CSIRO? Okay, there's, I guess there's a number of um, uh, arms to that. Uh, the first one is really the CSIRO will be doing very specific research for us because that particular research agreement is tied with us and also with um, Worley Parsons through our solution centre. So, <clears throat> We will be getting them to look at specific parts that customers will want to have printed and we'll be getting them to use the printer to potentially print parts for us as well. Okay, thanks David. Um, and as a further question, um, how does your, your powder technology work? <clears throat> it's, to be honest, I can't give you the specific details right now because we're still going through a patenting process. Um, they're in a, Without giving away too much, I can say it uses a process that's completely different from anything else in the marketplace at this point in time. And to explain a little bit about how powder processing or how the powder production process typically works is generally you have a large vat of metal which gets um, injected into an area where there's a high stream of gas hits it and it breaks the stream of metal up into very fine particles which eventually form balls and those tiny little spheres um, form a size, form a powder with a, a very varied distribution in size. Uh, our process works um, completely differently and the main differentiator which is important to note is that with most powder production processes the size or the amount of powder and the size range which you can use is typically only between 5 and 15 percent. In some exceptional cases it can be as high as 15 percent, uh, sorry 50 percent, but in most cases it's typically between 5 and 15 percent which means that if you <clears throat> could develop a process which could produce somewhere between 80 and 90 percent in the right size range, you'd have a much more efficient process. And we believe that's what we've done. Okay, thanks, David. Again, everyone, just a reminder: if you'd like to submit a question, you can do so through the webinar software. We're uh, we're actually on to the last question in the queue at the moment, David. Sure. Uh, and that was, uh, where do you see the company in uh, 12 months' time? Okay. Well, I think. For the most part, um, where we're planning to go, and it's a fairly aggressive timeline, has been mapped out by our um, r relative timelines that we've put out in the marketplace already. But essentially what we're looking to do in that time frame, we're looking to um, prove out the technology with a large format technology. We're looking to produce powder with a powder production unit and to ultimately build a full-size large powder production unit and then by within the next 12 months to be in full production with the medium format printers to have industry partners on board with that process and um, to be building our first large format printer as well. All right. Well, that's all the, uh, the questions we've received today, David. So I'll turn it over to you if you want to make any final remarks um, and then we'll wrap up the webinar. Okay. Well, look, there's, I guess there's two things I'd, I'd like to say just to wrap up. The first one is that um, this is a non-trivial exercise that we're going through in building this company. It's a, it's, it, it's an enormous task, and it's um, something that everybody in the company is absolutely committed to doing. Um, we've got a very brilliant team of people working with us, and they're working very hard to achieve the results that we're aiming to achieve. Um, so it's quite a step forward that we're making with each each um, each step that we do and we are kicking goals and these goals even though they might not seem like much to people who are just looking at it for the first time or possibly even the fifth time they're quite significant in the future development of the company and what we're ultimately trying to do with this is to create a real business because ultimately that's what we're about and the way we're going to be a, be create to create a real business is by developing the product, by getting the product to market, by building and selling printers, and by producing powders and producing the, and selling them as well. So the goal for us is to create a real solid company that will ultimately create shareholder value. Um, and that's, I think, the best way for us to do it. So um, if there's no further questions, I'm going to sign off here. Um, the only other thing I'm going to say at the end of it is that 
Um, I do recognise the value that shareholders bring to the company and we appreciate everything that everybody does for us and we're looking to um, continue this conversation on an ongoing basis. So if um, people have further questions as we go down the track, we'll be able to keep people updated. Thanks everybody.